Today, as we speak, I'd like to begin with prayer. Uh, precious Heavenly Father, would you open your word to us today to our understanding and inspire us and teach us, Lord, from your word today what you would show to us about this revelation of Jesus Christ. Help us today, Lord, to speak your word. We ask in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I'd like to focus today on the words of Revelation chapter 7, verse 17, which said, For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them <coughs> to living, living fountains of waters, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So my message today is called, God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. But today I'm also encompassing Revelation chapter 6 as well as chapter 7. In chapter 6 we find that the seven seals are open. In chapter 6 rather, the seven seals are open. In chapter 6 it says, I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, with a loud voice like thunder. Come and see. And I looked and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him and he went out conquering and to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth and the people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius. And do not harm the oil and the wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. And so I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed with him. A power was given to them over a fourth of the earth, to kill with the sword, with hunger, and with death, and by beasts of the earth. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them. And then in verse 12, I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth, as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of the place, of its place. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, of, and the rich men, the commanders, and the mighty men, every slave and every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of the, his wrath has come, who is able to stand. So that's chapter 6, which we also need to listen to today. In Revelation chapter 5, we read about the scroll in the right hand of God and which was concealed by seven seals. And in chapter 6, we begin with the opening of the first six of the seven seals. A call went out to find someone worthy to open the scroll. And Jesus the Lamb that was slain was the only one worthy to open the seals. All heaven rejoiced and burst into praise as the Lamb prepares to open the seals. Revelation chapter 6 speaks of the Lamb breaking these seven seals one by one. As each seal is opened, terrifying things begin to happen. The first six seals are mentioned in chapter 6, 
And the last seal, seal number seven, is mentioned in chapter eight. One view of Revelation, the historicist view, is that the spread of the fulfillment of the prophecies of the whole book of Revelation is over the entire church age and connects the breaking of the seals with the events occurring through the history of the church through to the end of time. So we believe these seals are speaking or signs of things that will happen and that some of them have happened already in history. The first seal referred to the white horse. We believe that covers the first period of time from AD 96 to 180 AD. John lived to, to the end of the first century and so it was from John's time on. This view says that the white horse represents the world power during the time when Christ's work was beginning. The Roman Empire had most of the known world under its power at that time. The famous historian, Gibbon, calls the reigns of five emperors during this time the happiest and most prosperous period in the entire history of the human race. That's quoted in the Halley's Bible Handbook. The word happiest obviously refers to secular history, not church history. It was not a happy time for the church. As we read about the persecution of the Christians during that time period, and we know that it was a time of great grief and sadness for them. We know that earlier under Nero, Roman Emperor Nero, thousands of Christians were crucified and thrown to wild beasts in Rome, while they were used as human torches. Under Nero, Emperor Nero, both the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter were put to death in this time period. Later in AD 95, under the Emperor Domitian, which I have mentioned previously, short but extremely severe persecution took place. Over 40,000 Christians were tortured and killed under his reign. Under this lead, the Apostle John, who wrote the book of Revelation, was banished to the island of Patmos, Revelation 1 verse 9. So the white horse represents that period of Roman history from AD 96 from John's time to 180. The second seal refers to the red horse, which refers to between AD 200 and 300. During that time, there were over 50 people who claimed the throne of the Roman Empire. In other words, in a 100-year period, from 200 AD to 300, there were 50 different men who sat on the throne of Rome in 100 years. That's an average of two years each. So how unstable is that? Revelation chapter 6 verses 5 to 6 refer to as a pair of scales held in the hand of one riding the black horse. And interestingly enough, one of the Roman coins that are in the British Museum today has a picture, a Roman coin, with those scales on it. It's talking about in Revelation. The necessities of life, wheat and barley, were the high prices. It gives you an example there of how much the, the wheat and the barley would be sold for it. A denarius in those days was a working man's wages for a day. You imagine the pain a day's wages for a quart of wheat. That's awful high prices. So inflation on basics of life. And that happened during that period. But the luxuries of oil and wine were not affected by these high prices. But staple foods were. This possibly means that rulers had plenty while the common people were in poverty. Those prices and those items referred to in the scripture imply that. So a very unstable time in Roman history. The fourth seal in Revelation chapter 6 is the pale horse. The pale horse represents death. A fourth part of the earth was killed with the sword, hunger, death and wild beasts. The Roman Empire in the years between 200 and 300 AD suffered terrible, a loss, terrible loss in population. So that implies war and disease and famine. 
followed by a huge increase in wild animals in the country. And these are all things that happened in that time period. The fourth seal, the pale horse, represents death. So these are all grim times that we're talking about. The fifth seal, mentioned in Revelation 6, 9 to 11, speaks of the, the great persecution of the church. Verses 9 to 11 say, When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? So when God's people are persecuted and cry out to God for deliverance from their persecution, God hears those prayers. The scripture says a white robe was given to them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren would be killed as they were, was completed. There had already been thousands of martyrs from the time of Nero and Domitian, the Roman emperors, and there were more to come. There were 10 official persecutions of the Christian church from the time of Nero in AD 64 to Diocletian in AD 305. 10 official periods of persecution. The vision of the fifth seal may even be a prophecy of future persecutions under the popes during the Middle Ages and perhaps even in the very last days prior to Christ's return. But it certainly happened in that time period. The sixth seal, Revelation 6 verses 12 to 17, talk about the day of wrath. The day of God's wrath. Many things are mentioned in this section. John wrote, I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth, as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains, And the rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the, lamb, the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who was able to stand? That's an awesome picture of God's judgment on the earth. Rulers strut around in their power while they're in power and think they're getting away with it. They're not. And God's going to inflict them with great judgment and that's speaking of it there. Could this refer to the 4th century upheavals in the Roman Empire? The Roman Empire collapsed with all sorts of calamities happening around that time. The mighty Roman Empire that once ruled the world and wielded its power came to a mighty end. The Empire, the Roman Empire, stopped its persecution of the church when the Emperor Constantine became a Christian in AD 312. He issued an edict of toleration or law, making it a law that people were free to choose their own religion. He moved the capital of, from Rome to Constantinople. Sadly, after him followed another Roman emperor, Theodosius, in AD 378 to 395, who made Christianity the state religion of the empire and church membership was compulsory. Do you immediately see red lights flashing when that happens? It's one thing to have freedom of religion to choose to become a Christian. It's another thing to make it compulsory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People then became Christians, so-called, because it was the acceptable thing to do and not necessarily because there was a change of heart. In order to keep your job, you became a Christian. That was a bad, bad move. The empire was divided between the west with Rome as its capital and the east with Constantinople as its capital. This was the beginning of the breakup of the mighty Roman Empire. 
They had for 300 years tried so hard to destroy Christianity, and Rome himself was destroyed. But we come to the part that interests interest us most today. Revelation chapter 7, it refers to God's people. In chapter 7, it talks about 144,000 who were sealed. The number 144,000 is the number 12 squared. Now it's multiplied by itself and then multiplied by a thousand. The Apostle James, in his epistle, in James chapter 1, verse 1, says, The twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. And he was writing to these Christians who were scattered abroad. So we take that to mean to the whole church. Thus, we interpret that 144,000 represent not just the Jews converted to Christ, but to all the new Christians, both Jews and Gentiles. The number of 144,000 is symbolic, representing all the true and faithful Christians. So it doesn't matter whether it was 110,000 or 200,000. It matters not. The, number, the emphasis is not on the number itself, but on the fact that God's people were sealed. So the 144,000 then stands for all of God's faithful people, Jew or Gentile. They are, just as the text of the Bible says, the servants of our God. All of God's servants from all of humanity are sealed. In other words, if you're a true Christian, you are a servant of God. The purpose of their sealing is to protect them, not from temptation, because as long as we're in the world, we'll be tempted. Not from temptation or even martyrdom. They weren't exempted from martyrdom. But to protect them from the judgment of God. God was going to judge those rulers of the world who persecuted the Christians big time. And God's sealing was to protect them from that because they're covered by the blood of Jesus. And then from verse 7, in chapter 7, it goes on to speak of a great multitude which no one could number, not just 144,000. A number was so great that no one could number it. From all the nations around the world, tribes and peoples and languages. What was the great commandment Jesus gave to his 12 disciples before he went back to heaven? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And that means that when Jesus comes back, that will have been accomplished. And we're well on the way to that now. Not there yet, but we're getting there. Well on the way. There are missionaries today who are translating languages that have never, ever been written before. And that takes a lot of skill to do that. But they've given them a lot of, because of the experience of translators, they now have a lot of experience in how to translate. So it helps speed it up a bit when they know how. So I'll read that again. A great multitude which no one could number, of all the nations, tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne, along with the elders and the four living creatures, falling on their faces before the throne of God. There'll be an almighty reunion of all the saints of all the ages in one place in heaven. That is a wonderful time towards which Jesus is bringing history to its full fulfillment. As we read the Bible and as we read history, we see that there was a terrible persecution of those who made a stand to follow Jesus. Jesus said himself while he was on earth, He who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Matthew 10, 38 and 39. If we think that we can have just enough religion to slide into heaven, then we better think again. There is no such thing as an easy road to heaven. The Bible tells us clearly that the way to destruction is a wide path, but the way to heaven is a narrow path. In Revelation chapter 7, there's a question in verse 13 that says, Who are these arrayed in white robes? And where did they come from? So John's seen these in, in the Revelation. 
And this is the answer given in verse 14. Who are these people in white robes? These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and no one they survived it. And they, they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. White speaks of being cleansed from your sins by the blood of Jesus who died on the cross. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. Remember Christians are servants of God? James said that. They serve him day and night in his temple, and he who sits on the throne, the Lord Jesus, will dwell among them, and they shall neither hunger any more, nor thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them. What does a shepherd do? The basic duty of a shepherd. Look after them, protect them, and lead them to living fountains and waters. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Sorrow is the devil's work. Wiping away tears is God's work. And in heaven, they will be permanent and forever. And God knows the sufferings of his people. You remember the first Christian martyr, Stephen, when he was being martyred? And Stephen was being stoned by his enemies. And he saw into heaven. And who did he see in heaven? He saw Jesus standing at the throne. Not sitting, standing. Jesus was moved with compassion for Stephen when he saw that happening. And that's how God feels about every saint who was persecuted. And there's another verse hidden away in the Old Testament that says, God is angry with the wicked every day. You think God's going to avenge all his saints? My word he is. The world better watch out. God will not tolerate that. So what is God saying to us through this passage from Revelation? That's what we want to know. The words at the end of chapter 7 sum up everything for us. The Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes forever. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8 gave his testimony along these lines. Romans 8, 35 to 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And Paul was talking about his present experience. Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written in the Old Testament, for your sake we are killed all day long, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter by those who hate us. Yet in all these things, Paul says, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We can conquer through the hard trials of life because he is with us. And Paul went on to say, I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things yet to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember, Paul, the same Paul who wrote that, was put to death by Nero. And he was persecuted long before that. He knew what he was talking about. And so, we can conclude that no matter what our circumstances are today or will be in the future, be it persecution or poverty or natural disasters or even death, there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God through Christ Jesus our Lord. He will be with us through all that life throws at us, and he will be with us through death. And even when we leave this world, we will be with him throughout the endless ages of eternity. The Lamb will shepherd them and lead them to living waters and living fountains of waters. This is God's promise from the Good Shepherd of our souls. 
we have his presence with us now and we, he can be, we can be in his presence throughout all eternity. So the question we have to face up to is this. Are you and am I living for him right now? Am I doing his will in my life? Am I walking in obedience to him? And does Jesus mean more to me than life itself? Can we, with the, say, can we say with the Apostle Paul, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain? You know what Paul is saying there? For me to live as a Christian is gain, and if I die, I still gain. So even if they take my life <coughs> and kill me, I can't lose. It's the same for us who are Christians. Whether we struggle in life with hardships, or whether they take our life and kill us. Either way, we cannot lose. Because Jesus is the ruler. So they're very serious things, but we have this assurance. The same one who brought the Christians through the, the great tribulation will shepherd us and take away all our tears forever. And we can be with all his saints from all the ages, from all around the world, forever. Protected by Jesus forever. So that is the blessing that's in that passage of Scripture today. Yes, there are grim things that the church went through, but we can know that if we go through hard times, the same Lord will be with us today. The book is meant to prepare us for what the present and the future may hold for us but most of all to prepare us for Jesus coming back. I'd like to close with the words of Revelation chapter 7, verse 12. Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honour and power and might belong to our God forever and ever. Amen. And so, Lord, with that prayer, we recommit ourselves to your care and keeping and we can live in boldness and assurance that you are with us through every trial of life and that nothing is too hard for you Lord it may well be too hard for us but Lord we recommit ourselves to you to keep us through those hard times but Lord we can rest knowing that you will bless us and keep us through hard times and there's nothing that you cannot bring us through Help us, O oh Lord, to strengthen our faith and our walk with you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Joe's going to come and lead us in our final course.